Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the Bullet Points Lunchtime Webinar Series on Firearm Injury Prevention for Clinicians. I'm Dr. Amy Barnhorst and I'm moderating today's session. And we're really excited to have Lisa Geller here, who's going to talk about the intersection of firearms, mass shootings, suicidality with domestic violence. And she's also going to talk about some policy solutions. But first, a few announcements. Um, don't forget to mark your calendars for every third Tuesday of the month at noon Pacific time for our webinar series. Just a quick 30 minutes where you can sit and eat lunch and listen and learn about firearm injury prevention. Our next webinar will be March 15th with Chris Knopke, who is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and it'll be about gun ownership. We're also gonna have our usual poll at the beginning and the end of each webinar. They're very brief. And again, these help us understand where our audience is coming from, what they know and what they learn from our webinars. You'll see a question on the poll asking about your profession. And if you select other profession, can you write your profession in the chat? This just helps us understand because we didn't have enough options to put all the possible professions in. Um, we appreciate it, thank you. And we're gonna launch the opening poll now for everyone to go through. Again, it should only take a minute and then I will introduce our panelists. Okay, great. Thanks everybody for completing that quick poll. And um, going forward, the um, chat function is gonna be disabled. And so if you have questions, please use the Q&A function. I'm gonna be going through them. And if there's a quick, you know, simple question, I'll answer it in the chat, but at the end, I'll consolidate some of the questions if there's similar ones and I'll give them to Lisa so that she can answer them. Um, and without further delay, I'd like to introduce Lisa. She is um, she holds a master's in public health in health policy and injury and violence prevention from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Health. And she is the state affairs manager at the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence. Her work focuses on research, advocacy, and implementation of evidence-based gun violence prevention policies, including extreme risk protection orders and domestic violence protection orders. Lisa's conducted research into the role of domestic violence in mass shootings in the US, and she also manages disarmdv.org, a comprehensive website that compares laws between states and provides information on the statutory process of firearm removals in cases of domestic violence protective orders. She also serves on uh, District of Columbia's Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board. Lisa was a contributor to our Intimate Partner Violence page on our Bullet Points website, which we were very grateful for. And she recently wrote a really informative blog post for us that um, is about the topic of today's webinar called Five Things You Should Know About Domestic Violence and Firearms. So take a look if you haven't had a chance to read her blog post yet. And thank you so much for coming, Lisa. I will let you take it away from here. Thank you, Amy, and to the whole Bullet Points team for having me today. And hi, everyone who's tuning in. Um, I'm just going to dive right in and start um, with just a brief overview of gun violence in the US and then talk um, specifically about domestic violence and the intersection between the two. So to frame this discussion, um, overall in 2020, which is the newest year of CDC data that we have available, which I will talk about um, again at the end as a, as a problem, we need access to data that is updated um, in real time, not lagging two years or a year and a half. But from the most recent year of data that we have, we know that there were over 45,000 gun deaths in the US. That's the most number of gun deaths that there have ever been in this country. Not the highest rate, but the most number of gun deaths um, exceeded 45,000 in 2020. Of those, 43% were homicides and 54% were suicides. That's more homicides than we typically see and, and fewer percentage of suicides. Typically about 60% of gun deaths are suicides, but there was a really large spike in homicides um, from 2019 to 2020. The overall gun death rate increased by 15% from 2019 to 2020. But this again was driven largely by homicide. So you can see the 20 year trend here in which the gun death rate increased 32% from 2001 to 2020. But from 2019 to 2020, there were an additional 5,000 gun homicides. I also wanna note that we saw an unprecedented increase in gun sales in 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. And there were a lot of reports of increases in domestic violence, specifically very um, serious and lethal domestic violence. Actually, interestingly, a lot of states and cities, localities reported a decrease in the number of people calling domestic violence hotlines or shelters. One of the reasons that could be is if people were quarantined at home or stuck at home during a stay at home order with an abuser, maybe they weren't able to call 
but there were actually um, a lot of reports of increases in severe domestic violence. So what is domestic violence? Um, this is a power and control wheel that's common in domestic violence prevention um, that was uh, developed by the Domestic Abuse Intervention Project in Duluth, Minnesota. And this definition that I'm going to give of, of domestic violence is from the Department of Justice. So they define DV as a pattern of abusive behavior in a relationship that's used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over another partner. Domestic violence can include physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological actions or threats of actions that influence another person. And again, this is not just physical behavior. I wanna emphasize that there's a lot of other forms of domestic violence that you can see in this wheel. Um, any behaviors that intimidate, manipulate, humiliate, isolate, frighten, terrorize, coerce, threaten, et cetera, someone is all considered domestic violence. Domestic violence is broader than intimate partner violence typically. Sometimes they're used interchangeably, but um, the way I see it, domestic violence is, is a broader form of violence that doesn't just involve DV between partners. Um, typically when I'm referencing um, uh, violence between a, a, a couple, I'm using the term intimate partner violence. One in four women and one in seven men experience or will experience severe violence at the hands of an intimate partner in their lifetime. So this is a violence um, that is very prevalent in this country and a public health crisis, just as gun violence is. So now I'm gonna talk about um, four groups that are disproportionately impacted or at a greater risk of domestic violence. But I do wanna note that anyone can experience domestic violence, though um, a lot of people talk about women primarily, men do, experience um, severe violence as well. And so if I'm using kind of gendered um, descriptions, um, sometimes I'm not doing it intentionally, but I do wanna note that women are at greater risk of violence, specifically lethal um, intimate partner violence. So the first two groups I'm gonna talk about, first women, um, specifically pregnant women and racial and ethnic minority women. Um, we know that women are more likely to be victims of violence, uh, intimate partner violence in general and intimate partner homicide. And this is especially risky um, for women who are pregnant. We know that there is um, an increase in violence among women when they are pregnant. So OBGYNs may be in a unique position to screen for IPV during pregnancy and um, those who screen positive to be referred to special services. So paying close attention to women during pregnancy who may be at risk of violence. The second group of women is racial ethnic minority women. I've put a chart in here from our website that shows um, the percent of IPV deaths. This is from a, a, a quite outdated study at this point. I couldn't actually find newer data from um, 18 states reporting um, intimate partner violence related deaths, as well as the pop percent of the population using 2011 data. I kind of just went in the middle of that study from 2003 to 2014 and picked um, data from that year. So as you can see, um, black non-Hispanic women and American Indian Alaska Native women are disproportionately impacted by intimate partner homicide as compared to the percent of the population that they make up. And the way that you can look at that is any group where the dark blue column is, is, um, sig is higher or is more than the light blue column, it's a disproportionate impact. The second two groups that I'm gonna be talking about are people, but especially women with disabilities and those who identify um, in the LGBTQIA plus community. Disabilities can range from mobility issues to cognitive disabilities or difficulties to hearing and vision impairment. And in general, adults that live with disabilities, um, any adults, not just women, are at an increased risk for abuse. Um, people with disabilities might be less likely to be able to care for themselves. They might be more reliant on someone, that someone could be a partner, which may lead to this power imbalance and a dynamic that could, uh, could include abuses of power. Um, in 2015, the rate of violent victimization against persons with disabilities was two and a half times that for persons without disabilities. I actually found a, a newer CDC statistic that found that about 25% of women, again, that one in four women in the U.S. are victims of IPV, but 60% of women with disabilities are victims of IPV and are longer and are, are likely to be victims of abuse for longer periods of time. I know there was a question that um, I was asked before this about children. Children um, with disabilities are also at an increased risk of violence and abuse compared to children without disabilities. Um, and one study I found looked um, found that 
Children with disabilities are three times more likely to be sexually abused than those without disabilities, almost four times more likely to be physically abused and nearly four times more likely to be emotionally abused than children without disabilities. Moving on to the final category that I highlighted here for who's most impacted by domestic violence. I, I don't have a ton of research on this, so I would really be interested if anyone in the chat has seen studies on this, but there is data showing that those who identify as LGBTQIA plus are at an increased risk of violence than those who do, do not identify in any of those categories. And LGBTQIA plus individuals may face additional barriers for seeking help that are unique to their sexual orientation and gender identity that those who don't identify in that category may not have be a barrier. Now, I'm not gonna touch too much on this, but I do wanna list some of the um, social determinants of health, some of the exposures um, that are uh, exposure to domestic violence are associated with. As you can see, a lot of these might not be, you know, unique to domestic violence, but these are just some of the things clinicians in screening for intimate partner violence um, can, can be aware of and can be tracking over time. And also the US um, Preventative Service Task Force has, I believe, a specific screening for clinicians for intimate partner violence. But this is just to show that domestic violence is um, exposure is widespread. Trauma inflicted from domestic violence can impact your physical health, your mental health, your overall well being, your productivity. And these are really lasting impacts that um, don't go away when abuse stops or you know, may never go away. And so I just wanted to make sure that I talked um, briefly about some of these. Moving specifically to the role of firearms, um, that's where my expertise is and something that I wanna spend the rest of this presentation talking about in the remaining 15 minutes that I have. Um, I highlighted three of the conditions that are most likely um, to impact into our intimate partner homicide, focusing on firearms here. We know um, that the past intimate partner violence is the best predictor of intimate partner homicide. And in most cases, um, people who are killed by intimate partners have um, experienced some of these acts in the past before the homicide occurred. And one of the tools that can help identify women at risk of intimate partner homicide or most at risk of intimate partner homicide is a danger assessment tool. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a lethality assessment. They, they're slightly different, but this was developed in the 1980s by Jackie Campbell, who was one of um, my mentors at Johns Hopkins. She's in the School of Nursing, but she's done a lot of research on the role of domestic violence um, and gun violence and the intersection between the two. And the danger assessment includes um, a, a variety of scoring instruments where victims of DV answer either yes or no to, to these risk factors. And so these are some of the ones here, you know, you answer yes, does your abuser have access to a gun? Yes or no? Have you ever been threatened with a gun? Um, yes or no? Have you ever been, um, has someone ever threatened to kill you with or without a gun? Yes or no? So um, the analysis, an analysis of the danger assessment found that women who were threatened or assaulted with a gun were 20 times more likely to be murdered than those who were not threatened or uh, assaulted with a deadly weapon. More facts about the intersection between guns and domestic violence. I included a few of these in my blog post, but nearly half of all women killed in the US are murdered by a current or former intimate partner. And over half of those homicides are by firearm, meaning that firearms are used to kill in intimate partner homicides more than all other means combined. And of course, that's because they're very lethal. Um, a woman is five times more likely to be murdered when her abuser has access to a gun. That's one of the statistics um, that Jackie Campbell found in her study from, from many years ago, I believe it was 2003. Um, but I also wanna note that guns are not just used to kill. In fact, so many women in this country are threatened with firearms or have been shot at and survived or, or shot and survived with a firearm. An estimate of 4.5 million women in the country have been threatened with a gun and nearly 1 million women have been shot or shot at. To provide some global context here, almost all women killed by guns in high income countries were American women, 92%. And American women are 21 times more likely to be shot and killed than women in other high income countries. And this is because it's so easy to get a gun in this country. Gun violence is a uniquely American issue, especially compared to other high income countries. 
and this study um, defines what the was what those countries are. Um, by the way, my sources are all on the bottom left. If you want to find some of these statistics, or if you're having trouble finding them, please feel free to email me. But I want to make sure I'm citing everyone. But um, in short, it's not surprising that American women are more likely to be shot and killed than women in other high income countries because of the availability of guns in the US. Turning to a study that I authored with colleagues at Johns Hopkins last year, I want to highlight some of the findings from the study, which specifically looked at domestic violence and mass shootings. We looked at mass shootings from 2014 to 2019, and we defined a mass shooting as incidents with four or more people shot and killed. Mass shooting fatalities actually represent a really small proportion of homicide fatalities, uh, fire and homicide fatalities in the US, estimates of about 1%. But we know that these are often the events that make the news and um, inflict a lot of psychological harm on individuals. So we were looking specifically at these very rare instances that um, obviously make the news and are on a lot of people's minds when discussing gun violence. And what we found was that between 2014 and 2019, 60% of mass shootings were DV related, meaning that the victims were family or intimate partners. And in almost 70% of those shootings, of mass shootings between 2014 to 2019, the perpetrator either killed at least one family or intimate partner or had a history of domestic violence. And these are known histories where there were news reports, there were criminal records that were easy to identify in the news sources. So this is a huge percentage. I, I was personally shocked. I went into researching this paper, not really knowing what I would find, but you know, convinced that domestic violence played a large role in mass shootings based on the news that I had seen, but I hadn't seen a lot of peer reviewed articles that looked at this. And so I personally was very shocked to see that almost seven in 10 mass shootings in the US have a DV connection. We also found that the case fatality rate, meaning the number of people who died um, compared to the, the number, number of people who were shot, total shot and killed or, or shot and survived, was greater for domestic violence related mass shootings than those not related to DV. So 16% of victims of DV related mass shootings survive compared to 37% of victims of non-DV mass shootings. And some of the reasons that we speculated for this was because these domestic violence shootings are of course um, very targeted. It's usually uh, a male partner intending to kill a female partner and her family, her children, anyone else who may be in the vicinity, coworkers, strangers that are in the area. And sometimes these public mass shootings, these non-domestic violence shootings that we think of may be less targeted to a specific individual. They may be targeting a group of people. For example, you can think about the El Paso shooting. You can think about the um, the, the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, you can think about the, um, eight, the, the temple, Sikh temple shooting in Wisconsin. I mean, there's, there's no shortage of these hate crimes that we can think of that may not be targeting one person in particular, like a DV shooting does, but really a group of people. And that may explain why the case fatality rate for these DV shootings is higher, where there may not be as many places to escape, and, it, and really the perpetrator is intending to kill one person or a group of people in the space. Another thing that we looked at was the um, perpetrators who died during these acts. We wanted to see how they died, if they died, how many of them died. And the main takeaway here is that most domestic violence mass shooting perpetrators died during the mass shooting. 65% of DV mass shooting perpetrators died. And of those that died, the vast majority of them died by firearm suicide. So there is this relationship here. I'm personally interested in exploring it more between perpetrating domestic violence and perhaps experiencing suicidality. And um, I, I won't say more on that because I have a few other slides that I wanna get to before some questions, but please feel free to look over these findings in more detail when the, um, recording goes around, or if you want to pull up the paper, there's a, a citation to that paper in the bottom corner as well. Some other research on this topic has found really just that this role, the role of firearms in these domestic shootings is key to whether more people will be shot. Um, males who perpetrated DV homicides were twice as likely to kill another person when they used a gun versus other means. 
I don't think that's really surprising when we think about it because firearms are so lethal. You don't really have to be next to someone to kill them with a firearm like you would with a knife. Um, but it's also not uncommon for these intimate partner homicide events to result in multiple victims. And I touched on this a little, some of the victims we saw in our mass shooting study were family, friends, new dating partners of the victim, coworkers, children in the vicinity, children of either the victim or the perpetrator, or perhaps they share children, that's also quite common, um, strangers as well, and um, police as well, and then perpetrator suicide. One study that I looked at of intimate partner homicides in 16 states found that about 30% of these intimate partner homicide events resulted in multiple deaths. Now, those intimate partner homicide events are not just mass shootings. That could be um, a situation where maybe two people are, are shot and it could be the partner, um, the, the abused partner and, and her child or the abused partner and her mother. So this is not, that doesn't mean that 30% of all mass shootings result um, in, in, uh, in a bunch of other deaths beyond the family members. So that's just looking at specifically um, intimate partner homicides. I want to turn to a few solutions that um, I, I think I've talked about the problem at length and I want to make sure I propose at least two policy solutions that exist, at least in a number of states to address this, um, this critical public health issue. So I'm going to talk briefly about domestic violence protection orders and extreme risk protection orders. Domestic violence protection orders are perhaps more familiar to those tuning in. They exist in every state in some, in some way, shape or form um, They can offer a bunch of protections to a victim of domestic violence or a survivor of domestic violence that can include firearms provisions, but also can include no contact orders, stay away provisions, move out provisions, et cetera. Whereas extreme risk protection orders, which go by a number of names in California, they're called gun violence restraining orders. In Illinois, they're called firearms restraining orders. They have a bunch of different names, but they, they exist in 19 states in DC. And these are civil orders based on domestic violence protection orders that only address firearms access. So they are designed to temporary, temporarily prohibit someone at risk of harm, either suicide or interpersonal violence from being able to access a gun during a set period of time. There's a temporary order that usually lasts about two weeks, just like there is for, for a, um, an ex parte temporary domestic violence protection order. And then there's a final order, which usually lasts up to a year, and during that period of time, individuals who are under an extremist protection order are not allowed to purchase or possess firearms and um, orders can be renewed, but um, they usually last, the, the final orders usually last for one year. So in short, ERPOs only offer firearms protections by temporarily removing guns from individuals at risk of violence, whereas domestic violence protection orders can offer multiple types of protections for individuals. This is a great resource from Johns Hopkins. We actually have a, um, the Ed Fund has a partnership website with Johns Hopkins called Implement ERPO. And I'll share the link to that at the end. But this is a great resource from our partners at Johns Hopkins about extremist protection orders and what clinicians need to know. Currently only three states offer um, clinicians to petition for an extremist protection order. That's Maryland, Hawaii, and DC. However, it, I think it is really important for clinicians to know, even if they can't petition, that this is a tool that exists. They can counsel their patients about it because family and, um, and law enforcement are typically the petitioners for extremist protection orders. That does vary by state. So Virginia, for example, does not have family um, or household members as eligible petitioners, just um, law enforcement. But you can um, click the link that's here to find out more specifically as it relates to clinicians. But I do wanna, and I think you can even get CME credit for doing this, so that might be a little incentive there. Um, but Shannon Frateroli, who really is spearheading this project and this work out of Johns Hopkins, has a survey of clinicians in Maryland, um, one of the states where clinicians can petition for an extremist protection order. And she surveyed clinicians there and found that 70% of them were unfamiliar with ERPOs. They had really you know, no idea what they were before they heard about it. But after receiving a description of extremist protection orders and what they're intended to be used for and how they can potentially help clinicians, 92% of them reported that they had identified or could identify a patient that they had where an extremist protection order would be appropriate. And 60% of them indicated that they would, um, they would likely or be interested in filing an extremist protection order for a patient 
who qualifies. But there are significant barriers for clinician populations. Um, number one being time. Clinicians are very overworked and there's often not enough time to go to court and do the paperwork that's required. So she also identified a bunch of options to mitigate some of these barriers. One being having a coordinator manage the extremist protection order process, having training on extremist protection orders, the ability, ability to participate in court hearings remotely and having access to legal counsel. The remote court hearings is especially, uh, particularly relevant now during um, the, the COVID pandemic because a number of states that I work in have opened up their extremist protection orders to remote hearings just to minimize the number of people that have to come into court and be exposed or potentially expose others to COVID. So where do we go from here? Um, a few things that I mentioned early on for clinicians, this list is, by the way, not exhaustive. There are so many more things that we can and we need and we should do, but just two things quickly. Clinicians um, can screen for IPV, especially OBGYNs with pregnant patients, and refer those who screen positive to support services. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends that all women of reproductive age actually be screened for IPV and that social services be referred, support services be referred for people who need them. Also, clinicians can and should be familiar with policy options to prevent further abuse, um, such as civil protection orders, the extremist protection orders, and the DV orders. But I understand that clinicians have a lot on their plate and will not always have time to pursue, pursue these options with their patients. But even leaving paperwork in a waiting room, providing information should a patient want to learn more, those are a few small ways that clinicians can engage in this process and keep their patients safe. What do we need? We need better data to understand the problem. As I mentioned, I'm just looking at 2020 CDC data, but it's February, 2022. So I really would love to see what happened in 2021 and not have to wait another 10 months to get that data. So better data for that. We definitely need better data and reporting for domestic violence and intimate partner violence and homicides in the US. There are some states that do a really good job reporting this. There are, there are some states who don't report it at all. And you can find out a little bit more about that through um, disarmdv.org, which is a resource I'm gonna talk about in a second. And finally, especially as it relates to extremist protection orders, we need more robust implementation of these laws, more education, more training, champions on the ground who know how this process works and can train others, especially law enforcement who are really engaged in this process quite frequently and are the ones actually removing the guns. So three quick resources, or actually two, disarmdv.org is a website that we manage um, with partners from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, the Alliance for Gun Responsibility and Prosecutors Against Gun Violence. You can find out about the laws in each state as it relates to DV and guns, and you can find out about statistics if they exist on domestic violence homicides. This is a screenshot of what the homepage looks like. And finally, the Bloomberg American Health Initiative's website, Implement ERPO, is a great resource that we work on with Johns Hopkins and other partners with a lot of information about extremist protection orders, what it is, how to file, the process for getting one, what it's used for, um, data on it. And so please check both of those out and I am here to answer any questions. And I know I'm at one minute left. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lisa. That was great. Um, I learned a lot from watching that. We have a couple of really good questions too. Before we do questions though, we're gonna do our brief closing poll. Um, so if you all would just take a minute to fill the poll out and then we'll get to some Q and A. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna start with a question about um, if, if more states are currently considering policies to allow clinicians to petition for ERPOs, and I'll, I'll add on to that, what are some of the benefits and um, downsides of that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm actually working with our partners in New York right now um, at New Yorkers Against Gun Violence. There's a senator um, in, the, in, the New York, um, in New York who is a state senator considering adding healthcare providers as eligible petitioners and ask for some recommendations here. And I should say that my organization and the Consortium for Risk-Based Firearm Policy, which is an organization um, that we manage that is made up of a lot of experts on mental health, on domestic violence, gun violence, um, and other issues. 
and then clinicians included in that do recommend that healthcare providers be eligible petitioners, but also recognize that there are significant liability issues, um, confidentiality issues. And so these are some of the barriers that we um, are, are kind of up against when we work on this type of legislation and, and we are up against in New York right now. I think you can talk to 10 clinicians in New York and maybe they're gonna have 10 different opinions on whether this is a good idea and how it should be um, enacted. So we wanna make sure that we're connecting the state Senator to the right people in the state, that we're talking to the right people to kind of address these issues. And also looking at how New York state law is already written for um, some, some similar types of, you know, like involuntary commitment or similar legislation where um, clinicians might have um, a role or might already be playing a role in who is eligible in that state to, to do some of those things. So there's certainly pros and cons. Um, there's certainly different opinions among clinicians, whether this is a good idea or not, but um, we take the position that if done correctly, this can be a positive thing. Great, thanks. Um, we, there was a few questions actually about the relationship between domestic violence and suicide, if you have a minute to elaborate on that. Yeah, definitely. I um, can speak, I guess, just to the study I did. There is some research on this um, showing that suicidality may be a risk factor for perpetrating domestic violence. Um, it, you know, there's other other risk factors that well, as well that I talked about, but um, there may be a, a situation where a perpetrator is um, suicidal and in the process takes the lives of everyone around them and then and then takes their own life. That's quite common with the mass shootings that we looked at. So I would say that there, there are definitely intertwined issues. Definitely, we want to talk about domestic violence pre prevention and suicide prevention. Um, it's going to be different case by case, but perhaps there's an individual who's suicidal, primarily suicidal, and in the course of carrying out their own suicide, they are, are homicidal as well. Yeah, those are scary, scary cases. And, and really to this question also, and I realize we're over time, but maybe we can take two more minutes to finish up questions and folks who need to go can, if we want to see the answers can watch the recording. Um, how often does domestic violence leak into the workplace in terms of, you know, becomes workplace violence, but it actually started as a DUV incident? I don't have a number for that, so I'm not not going to give like a, a how often percentage. But um, the instance we looked at for domestic violence, mass shootings specifically, some of them did occur in the workplace where an abusive partner will show up at their partner's workplace and kill them and kill coworkers. Um, and so I definitely caution against talking about domestic violence as this private issue for this exact reason. This is not an issue that just happens in the home and you leave the home and everything's fine. We need to really, you know, destigmatize domestic violence support services so that people don't feel like this is not something they can talk about, um, especially, you know, with, with their healthcare provider. This is a, a public health crisis that exists outside of the home as well and in the workplace as one example. Great, thank you. And we'll do one last question um, for those who are still on. Can you talk about how ERPO procedures differ from, um, PFA protective order procedures? Yes, so this is gonna vary by state. So I'll kind of give um, a general answer, but as I mentioned, extremist protection orders are um, civil orders that are, are also modeled off of domestic violence protection orders. So the process can be similar. Um, you know, there's this ex parte or temporary phase where someone requests a uh, ERPO or a protection order because the risk of violence is really imminent. And during that period of time, maybe a, a firearm will be removed. And then the respondent after that temporary period is over would be able to make their case in court and explain why they should be able to keep their guns. You know, we, we drafted these laws with keeping due process in mind and recognizing that you can't remove firearms indefinitely without having a respondent be able to show up and, and state their case. Mm -hmm. I will say though, that you don't always have to get an emergency order. You can go straight to a final order in some states. So the process is similar. Please check out the American Health um, Initiative's website, Implement ERPO for the state-by-state -state information. So that, um, you know, my answer is not definitely uh, relatable for every state of person who's on this call. Thank you so much, Lisa, for all of this good info and especially for the resources that we can use going forward.
And um, we just really appreciate having all of this in our webinar. And for those of you who are gonna join us next month, don't forget our March webinar on the 15th and you can look for the registration link in your email. And um, we'll see you all then. Thank you. Thanks so much.